Good day, money makers. My name is Paul Duplessy, aka the EMS guy. And today, my name is Sir Isaac Newton. Because we're going to talk about when one thing, when we've got a specific action, it leads to a specific opposite reaction. And this is all in this next video that we're talking about the circular flow in the economy. So make sure you hit like, subscribe, watch, and let's do this. Money makers, so as we're starting this video, make sure that you have a notebook, a pen, paper, anything that you can scribble on to make notes. So hit pause, make sure you're ready, and then we're going to do this. All right, so after this lesson, you must understand a few key terms. What's a circular flow? What's a closed economy? What's an open economy? That means is there foreign trade or not? Um, we're going to look at the participants in an economy as well as the factors of production, different markets. So you have to strap on your boots because we're running today. So as a bit of recap, in the previous years, in grade 8, we talked about the factors of production. Remember, there's four and it's owned by us, the households, the individuals, right? And that's something that we give to the businesses, which we can start businesses with. So the first one is natural resource. Then we have capital, our labor and entrepreneurship. So these are things that we own as individuals. But do we have it and do we just use it or give it away for free? No, there's a cost involved, right? When your parents work, they get a salary. So what's the remuneration, the income for your factors of production that we have? Natural resources is rent. Capital is the interest. If you go and put money into a bank, the bank will give you interest if you invest. Labor, you know it's salaries and wages. And entrepreneurship is the profit that the entrepreneur makes. That's why he starts a business. So these are just a few core concepts that we need to know. Now, in an economy, we must understand if it's closed or open. So when you have a closed economy, right, that means that the economy only functions within its own boundaries. So there's no outside influences. So an economy works with um, a few participants, must be buyer, seller, someone that governs it. But now if it's closed, that means no one from the outside can come in, right? Open economy then means we can actually have foreign investors or foreign um, producers in our economy where we can import and export. So South Africa, we've got an open economy because we like to import and export, especially with our neighboring countries. Um, yes, yeah. so looking at the next one, we have the consumer, suppliers and the government. Now these three you've all learned about already. These are the three participants in any economy. If there's no businesses, suppliers, and there's no consumers, then there won't be anything to trade. But we need someone to govern and we know what's the basic function of government is to make legislation to govern. They're the referees, right? So they're the three more um, participants. Now we've done this previously. So remember, there's a mix, the plan and a marked economy. So in this, we are actually focusing on a mixed economy because the government is involved, but they're not totally taking it over. Right. So when we look at the consumer as a participant, they are the ones that buys the final goods and services from the suppliers, but they need money. So where do they get their money from? This is where they work and they provide their factors of production to the businesses. So they own the factors of production. They sell it to the businesses, which buys it from them. And then the um, consumers have got money to buy goods and services, which the businesses makes. Um, using the factors of production. So it's this beautiful system, um, this dynamic system that keeps on evolving and growing. So when we look at the producers, this is all the businesses in the system. So they receive the factors of production. I use the abbreviation FOP and they make and produce the final goods and services. So in return for that, they um, get payment for the goods that they sell from the consumers so that they can pay the consumers for the factors of production. All right, so let's look at the uh, example of how this looks like. So the households, they give the factors of production to the producers, right? So I, as a person, I go and work at the business. So I literally give my labor to a business or a producer. The producer says, thank you, I'm going to convert it into goods and services, which you can then buy at a later stage. But now there's no money involved. This has just been a factor of production and a final good. This flow we call the real flow. So it's just goods and services. And what do we need to, meet to pr produce goods and services? Factors of production. All right. So we know this is not for free. So 
the producers have to pay for the factors of production so that the households can have money to buy goods and services. But the government plays an important role. It's not just the businesses and households. The government makes rules, regulations. They employ people from the households. They buy goods from the um, businesses and they pay salaries. They um, provide essential goods and services, but they need goods and services in order to provide the essential goods and services. The government doesn't have a magic bank somewhere to just take the resources from and supply it. They buy it from specific businesses or they have to produce it themselves. So they want to buy for other factors of production from the households. Right. So some of the parastatals, ESCOM, SAADNL, Telcom, you should know. All right. So in the circular flow, we've done a consumer and a producer, right? But now there's an important middle participant, which is the government. They regulate, but they're not uh, in an isolated bubble. They need to get factors of production, our uh, um, labor, our capital that we invest, let's say government retail bonds. They need these resources in order to provide essential goods and services that they provide to us. Now, again, there's a monetary um, system involved, and this is where we pay taxes. So this is where the government gets money in order to pay us, in order to render to us the services as well. So you can see that it's like Newton's law. For every action, there's opposite equal reaction. So here we can see, um, like we know, where the households give the factor of production to the producers and they get goods and services in return. Um, but now the government provides these goods to households and to producers in return for taxes. All right. So now we get to an interesting part in this topic. How do we form prices? Because a price is also a dynamic thing. It needs to change as the market changes. Now this is the, um, solely dependent on supply and demand, right? But also with some government intervention to say, listen, you cannot control a monopoly. They can regulate the market. So the government has a, a, a role to play, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, they've put a cap on certain medication to say you can't charge more than this. So they've got an important part to play. Now we're talking about there's two types of markets. Now in a market, that's where there's a lot of buyers and sellers. There's a lot of information available and we can actually compare it. The prices are comparable. So you get a factor market. Now what do we buy and sell on a factor market? You're right. It's the factors of production. And then on the other side, we have the goods market. What do we buy and sell in a goods market? You're right again, the final goods and services. So when we look at the product market, now this is where the supermarkets, for example, where they collectively form a product market. So when we go to a business, a retailer, this is where we buy products. That's a type of a market. When you buy something over the internet, of take a lot. That's another type of market. So there must be exchange. It must be a place where we can exchange it. Now, let's say there's a, drought right there's no rice we cannot um, supply the farmers cannot supply to us so the factors of production is in a high demand now we have to import that means the costs are higher but because there's such a high demand the price increases on the other hand if there's too much rice then there will be an oversupply that everyone sells rice and then in order to get attention and for business to survive they will have to drop their prices. The last market that we're talking about is the factor market. And this is where businesses are actually just looking for uh, people with specific skill sets, right? So this doesn't have to be a, any place specifically. I don't see businesses walking around calling out, Hey, I'm looking for someone that can do dental work. They place ads in newspapers. They go to headhunting agencies. That is called a market. This is where the co consumers and the businesses connect. Now there's been a lot of information shared. That's why you need to always have a notebook in business. It's important to always jot down notes. All right. So I hope you've done that. In the next video, we're going to draw it all out. And hopefully by then you'll have a much better understanding. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Let's shift our learning.